Okay, today we, okay, today we're going to look at plants um, at the cellular tissue and organ level. So let's get started. First, I wanted to review the double fertilization because I know it can get a little confusing. So let's just review that real quickly. Um, like I always like to do, let's start at the embryo. And that, of course, is inside the seed. And then it germinates. And once it reach, reaches maturity, then we have flowers. And remember, we have male and female parts to the flower. So we have our female organ, which is the pistil, which contains the ovule. And within the ovule is the megaspore. OK, and so that this right here is the megaspore. <clears throat> so basically what we need to know is that there's an egg cell right here and then there is the polar nuclei right here. So the polar nuclei is diploid and the egg cell is haploid. So then let's go back up and look at the male organ, the stamen, which contains the anther that has pollen grains. Okay, so the pollen grain, if you'll remember, produces a pollen tube for the sperm to um, be contained in, and there are two sperm within that pollen grain. One fertilizes the egg, just like you would normally think of, and that comes together to make the zygote that develops into the embryo. So the sperm plus the egg, both being haploid, equals a diploid zygote. The other sperm fertilizes the polar nuclei. So that sperm being haploid plus the diploid polar nuclei equals a triploid endosperm. And remember the endosperm it was what provides nutrition to the embryo while it's growing. Okay so that's just a quick review of double fertilization and that's what's unique to angiosperms. So I'd like you to take a minute just to go look at this YouTube video. It just shows exactly what we talked about with double fertilization. Some people tend to get it a little bit more when it's in an animated form, so I've provided this link for that. So starting at the cellular level, what makes plants different from animals and different from bacteria? Well, to start with, plant cells um, have a cell wall, whereas animal cells do not. And because of that, they have what's called pl plasma desmida. Plasma desmida are basically tubes that go between the two different cells and go through the cell wall um, to allow for cell-to-cell -cell connection. Um, when it comes to cell division, uh, cell division within a plant cell involves a cell plate, whereas an animal cell um, involves a cleavage furrow, so just a slight difference. And then during mitosis, there are no centrioles in plants, but there are in animal cells. Plant cells have plastids, such as chloroplasts, um, and anim animal cells typically do not. And then in plant cells, they have very large vacuoles. That's what allows for the turgidity of the cell, and oftentimes the turgidity of the plant overall. And in animal cells, there either are no vacuoles, or if they have vacuoles, they tend to be very small. So this is what that looks like then, um, just in a diagrammatic form. So I'm going to just let you review that, all the thing, differences between plant and animal cells. And for this particular unit, you do have a worksheet to fill out. Um, I've allowed you to also see the website that, that shows you the answers to it. So do test yourself. See if you can label those parts and then go check and make sure that you're correct. Okay, so when the plant starts to develop, it has what we call meristems. Remember I told you when we get into plants, we're going to start talking a new language. So let's work with that. <laughs> You kind of know what stem cells are, so this helps a little bit. So the first cells to develop in a plant embryo are called meristems. And they're undifferentiated, and they can divide indefinitely and give rise to other meristematic cells, or they can give rise to 
specific differentiated cells. So meristems are present at embryonic growth and they're present in the developing parts of a plant. So this is kind of what it looks like over time. You have a single meristematic cell and when it divides it makes another meristematic cell or it can also create a differentiated cell. Let's, let's just say a leaf cell or a stem cell. Okay, that was not actually a pun that was intended, but that's kind of funny. Okay, um, so that's how the meristematic cells work. And there are three types of meristems in plants. The first is what we call the apical meristem. So if you think about the word apice, that usually means on the end of something uh, or at the tip of something. So an apical meristem occurs at the tip of a shoot and of a root. A shoot basically means the portion of the plant that's going to be above ground. And it produces um, some primary tissues. It, there's the shoot apical meristem and the root apical meristem. And those primary tissues are going to be like the, um, how, let me think about that, the epidermis, the um, primary xylem and the primary phloem, those types of things. So they, it produces primary tissue. Then there's what we call the lateral meristem. Lateral meristems only occur in mature parts of the plant. So they may come along after a year or two of growth even. They're also called secondary meristems. And that's what produces things like um, secondary xylem, which you'll learn what that is. Um, it produces uh, the layers of bark that you're used to, so more mature tissues. That comes from the lateral meristem. And then the third is the intercalary meristems. And these occur between mature tissues. So, but they actually only occur in what we call the monocots, which are the grasses, for instance. So they allow plants to regenerate after animals graze on them or we mow grasses down. So they're intercalary meristems. So the apical meristems are found in the embryo and in the tips of shoots and roots. And they are responsible for the primary growth in plants. So three um, apical meristems give rise to three primary tissues within a plant. So the apical meristem is, like I said, divided into three different types. There is the uh, protoderm meristem, the ground meristem, and the procambium meristem. And these give rise um, succinctly to, from the protoderm meristem, gives rise to the epidermal tissue. And that's just like our skin is our epidermis. It provides the protective outer covering of the plant. The ground meristem gives rise to the ground tissue. That one's easy. That's what feel, fills the interior of the plant. It's the majority of the bulk of the plant. And then there's the procambium meristem. That gives rise to the vascular tissue. Remember we've talked about um, xylem and phloem. Those are vascular tissue. And the primary vascular tissue comes from the procambium meristem. You've seen this slide before, but this is just to give you an idea where these tissues are. And we can talk again about which apical meristem they are derived from. So um, let's start from the bottom. Actually, we're going to start with number three and work our way back up. So the dermal tissue comes from the protoderm meristem. And so there's that outer covering that comes from the protoderm. The ground tissue, like I said, makes up the bulk of the plant. That comes from the ground meristem. That one's easy. Um, the vascular tissue which is in the center right here, the xylem and the phloem, comes from the procambium. So that's, those are the three apical meristems and the three primary tissues that they produce in plants.
So when you th let me just give you this hint. So when you think primary growth, think up and down. When we start to talk about secondary growth, that is what produces the girth or the width of the plant. So our primary growth is what allows it to grow tall. So remember we said our apical meristems are present in the embryo and at the tips of the roots and the shoots, and that's because they start in the embryo. So for instance, here we're looking at the um, apical meristems that we talked about, and this part right here is going to become the shoot or the top part of the plant, right? Um, and so that is the shoot apical meristem, and then this portion down here is called the root apical meristem, and those will remain throughout the plant life in order to create primary growth. This is our intercalary meristem. So remember we said that the intercalary meristems, they're also responsible for primary growth, by the way, and they are located on nodes of our monocot plants. And these really are our quick growers. So in our picture right here, there's a collar, and that narrow band is the intercalary meristem. So that's why when we mow the grass, I don't know how many of you have um, a lawn that you have to mow, but they always say only cut the top third because if you were to cut this uh, grass down here, it could not regrow because you have cut off the intercalary meristem. So next is our lateral meristems, and remember we said that the lateral meristems are what's responsible for the growth of the plant um, in the outward direction. The girth of the plant makes it wider. Um, all our <clears throat> primary meristems, our apical meristems, are for uh, making the plant taller. So lateral meristems make it wider. Um, and there are two types. The first is our vascular cambium and that develops right here between the primary xylem and the primary phloem. So we know the function of the xylem and the phloem. Um, the vascular cambium produces secondary xylem towards the inside so as it produces more and more this primary xylem will go in further and it produces primary fl uh, phloem, uh, sorry, secondary phloem to the outside. So the width between the primary xylem and the primary phloem becomes wider and wider. So that allows for the girth um, to increase. The other lateral meristem is what we call the cork cambium, and that produces cork to the outside right there. So if you can picture as it continues uh, to get wider and wider, we would have uh, lots of secondary xylem here, and then our primary xylem would be at the edge, and then our cork cambium, and then the cork being produced even further to the outside. All right, so now we've looked at plant cells and their difference um, between plant cells and animal cells. We've looked at um, where the tissues are derived from or the meristems. So now let's move on and look at the tissues themselves. So there are three different types of tissues in plants and we mentioned it before. There's the epidermal tissue and that covers the entire body of an herbaceous plant and it also covers the entire body of young woody plants before the cork cambium develops and starts producing cork towards the outside. Um, the second type of tissue is the ground tissue, and that forms the bulk of a flowering plant. And then the third type is the vascular tissue, which we've talked about quite a bit, the xylem and phloem, and that's re responsible for transport of water, minerals, and nutrients throughout the plant. Okay, so let's begin with our epidermal tissue. And uh, this cross section up here of a leaf kind of gives us an example of where all these um, tissues lie. So particularly we're going to start with the epidermis. That would be on the bottom side of a leaf and on the top side and it just covers um, the outside of the plant itself. And sometimes it also has a 
waxy cuticle over the top and that just protects it, um, prevents desiccation. And then um, sometimes these epidermal tissues have very special modifications and we see one of those here and the bottom of a leaf we have what's called guard cells and their structure is such that um, they can basically be very turgid or they can release a lot of water and depending on how much turgid turgidity they have it allows the opening between two guard cells, the stomata, to either open or close and allow for gas exchange as well as um, evaporation of water. We've talked a little bit about that, but that is a particular epidermal, uh, t epidermal cell modification. Another modification of epidermal cells is in the roots, and that is our root hairs. Remember we said those were um, modif modified epidermal root cells and that is useful for increasing surface area so that we can um, absorb more water and nutrients so the greater surface area to volume ratio we have the larger amount of absorption that can take place so that's why it's so important that the epidermal cells in roots can be modified to have root hairs also, just as a side note, we also talked about how those root hairs can have a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria as well, so that's just another modification. In stems and leaves, we can have trichomes, and that's a different modification of epidermal cells, and that word trichomes from, comes from a Greek word meaning hair, because that's what it looks like. Um, and it really provides several functions, um, two of which are sun protection and discouraging predators from eating it. Um, you know, predators aren't going to want to eat a hairy plant. Can you imagine eating such a thing? Um, but not only is it just a hairy texture, but they do also sometimes contain toxins that can then um, really bother the predators. You don't need to know the details of this, but just letting you know that there are so many different varieties of trichomes. They can be glandular or non-glandular. Um, typically, if they're glandular, they usually contain a toxin. So here's one you're probably familiar with, and that is uh, the stinging nettle. If you've ever brushed up against it, you know that it really does sting like crazy. It's not fun. And the way that works is each trichome hair um, has these cells that are uh, twisted really tight and so when the top portion is engaged those lateral cells untwist and therefore release the toxin um, onto whoever's bothered it in this case us um, and that point at the top is almost like a hypodermic needle so it's in your skin, the cells twist, and out comes the toxin to bother you, and it really does hurt. Okay, and here are our epidermal cells in leaves, and I kind of jumped the gun a little bit on this one and already mentioned our guard cells with our stomata. Um, so actually, technically, this should be guard cells, since the stomata is the opening between the guard cell, so let's change that. Let's say guard. Ooh, I cannot write like this, y'all. Okay, um, so those are right here, and we've talked about that quite a bit, so I probably won't mention it too much more, but um, but the leaves can also contra contain trichomes, just like uh, the stems did, so we mentioned that, guard cells. Um, the difference that I do want to mention with our guard cells and our stomata is that when we have eudicots versus, di uh, versus monocots, there are different patterns where we see stomata in those two different types of plants. So in eudicots, we see the stomata almost exclusively on the lower surface of the leaf, whereas in monocots, they're on both the upper and lower surfaces of the leaf.
So let's um, go on to the next slide and think about why that might be. Okay, so here's our example of our monocot and our dicot or eudicot. Um, to the left, remember we said the stomata and guard cells are on both surfaces? Well, most monocots are going to be grasses and their leaves tend to grow upright, so they really get equal sunlight on either side. So they're going to need those um, stomata on either side. Eudicots, however, tend to have a growth pattern like this hosta on the right, where the top surface gets most of the sunlight. And so in order to prevent desiccation, we don't have a whole lot of stomata on the top side because then we would lose too much water. So most of these stomata and guard cells will then be on the underside of most eudicot plants. Okay, so what about woody plants? What about the epidermis there? Okay, the epidermal layer on the stem of a woody plant tends to be replaced with cork cells once that cork cambium starts producing cork towards the outside, the epidermal layers just get sloughed off. Um, so in our picture here, let me get my little pointer. Um, so here is our thin layer of cork cambium. And here is the cork that's produced towards the outside. And that epidermal layer at the very edge, if there's anything left, is going to get brushed off. So the cork cambium produces cork cells towards the outside of the stem. And just for terminology's sake, just so you know, the cork cambium plus everything that it produces is called the periderm. And we see that right here. Um, just to kind of give you an idea a little bit more about um, what's in this image, just um, really just for clarification's sake. Um, we have our primary xylem in the center here, and here is the phloem right here. And then we tend to get xylem rays that come across like that. And that, um, and the, I'm sorry, phloem rays. Ah, sorry, I said the wrong thing. Phloem rays. And then we have secondary xylem right here. And we will have secondary phloem out here. OK, so let's just talk a little bit more about this cork cambium. Um, like we said, it produces cork towards the outside. And the cork cells um, are dead at maturity. They have um, a pretty large volume, and the walls are impregnated with what we call suberin. And suberin is a lipid that um, waterproofs that those cells on the outside. So that basically gives us um, an impenetrable layer on the outside of a woody plant that water does not go through. So if you think about it, just like the cuticle caused a gas exchange problem in herbaceous uh, plants that, that was solved by stomata, the cork causes the same problem for woody plants. So although it's protective, um, gas exchange is unable to occur when that cork is present. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we have what are called lenticels or lent lenticels. Um, which are essentially cracks in the cork that allow for gas exchange to occur um, between the outside and the interior of the stem. So this is just it at modification. So this whole layer out here um, is the cork, that dark stain. The cork cambium layer is right here. And remember, those two together are called the periderm. So a lenticel is this crack in, in that cork layer so that it allows gas exchange to occur. So you can think of uh, lenticels as the adaptation that makes sure that gas exchange is still allowed to take place. So what that looks like on a regular stem or a, um, a tree is just right here. I'm sure you've seen that on lots of trees. They look just, just like little holes, and that's pretty much essentially what they are.
So we are all familiar with corks because we use those for stopping uh, wine bottles to keep wine fresh. And I think most of you know that they are harvested from a particular oak tree that produces a lot of cork. Um, and that oak tree, its name is Quercus suber. So if you'll remember, I said that cork um, had within its cell walls a lipid called suberin. So that's where that name comes from, Quercus suber. So um, that's just a fun fact, but also good to know where your uh, scientific names come from. Okay, so that was our epidermal tissue. Now let's move on to ground tissue. That's what forms the bulk of flowering plants. And there are three different cell types that make up ground tissue. There is parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. So parenchyma is the most abundant, and it doesn't tend to have a lot of specialization. Um, they're just large, thin-walled cells, and many of them contain chloroplasts, or sometimes they have colorless plastids that um, are used for food storage. So for instance, within a potato tuber, we tend to have a lot of storage of starch in these parenchyma cells. So they can divide and give rise to specialized cells and so when we are doing uh, clippings if if you've ever done any um, gardening um, let's here let's go to the next slide there we go for plant propagation um, when we clip a hydrangea leaf and we cut off at the bottom we cut it off from the stem at a pretty specific place actually right here um, and then you plant it in soil those parenchyma cells then, based on some hormones that are present, then start growing root cells. So plant propagation brought to you by parenchyma cells. Okay, colenchyma cells are a little bit thicker and they form in bundles and usually just underneath the epidermis. And that's what provides structural support, particularly for herbaceous plants. So sometimes you'll feel um, a plant will even like the hydrangeas that we were just looking at. Their stems tend to have a slightly more rigid section to them, like a rib, and those are made out of our colenchyma cells with the thickened cell walls. And our third type is the sclerenchyma. Now they're, um, they have very thick secondary cell walls and they have a lot of lignin in them. Most of them are dead at maturity and they tend to um, function as support as well and they can have long fibers or they can have what's called sclerids which are a shorter uh, more squatty type of cell. That's what they look like under the microscope so we either have fibers or we have um, sclerids. So this is just what I wanted you to see so that you understand this on a practical level. Our uh, sclerenchyma fibers are what we see in uh, flax. And flax is used to make linen. So those long fibers like this, those are natural fibers that are used to make clothing out of linen. And then our sclerids are what are present in uh, our peanut shells or in the pit of a peach that make it very, very hard. Okay, so here is just a summary of those three different cell types that make up our plant ground tissue. And remember, the plant ground tissue is just what makes up the bulk of the plant. Okay, so let's move on to our vascular tissue. Our vascular tissue, as we've said, is responsible for water, water mineral, and tr nutrient transport. And there are two different types. There's xylem and phloem. Now, what makes these a little bit different is that they are what's called complex tissues. So they are composed of more than one type of cell. And we're going to look at those and look at the difference in their organization within a dicot or versus a monocot. So first let's look at the xylem. The xylem has four different types of cells. They have vessel elements, tracheids, they have sclerenchyma cells that give support, and parenchyma cells that are there just to store various substances. 
So the vessel elements are sort of like um, vessel elements and tracheids make up the main portion of what allows for the transport of water and minerals. So um, on this image here, let me get myself together. Our vessel elements have these perforated plates. And so water can flow through. It also has pits that allow them to fl flow across. And then the tracheids are the smaller of the two. And remember we talked about how they have a variety of uh, protein forms that allow water to move up but not to flow back down, typically speaking. So here we see the pitted, um, the sieve plates there and our pitted walls. Also within this, so we have, for instance, in this image we have our vessel element um, and our and our tracheids on the outsides, and then um, we also have our parenchyma cells. All that together makes up the xylem. Okay, so we know about the primary xylem, right? That allows transport of water and minerals up and down the plant. Well, the secondary xylem which is produced by our vascular cambium produces secondary xylem and what that means is that we're going to allow for water transport um, as the plant grows wider. So at the very center here is the pith. That's all ground tissue. And then remember we said we had um, our Procambium, which produces our initial primary xylem. Okay, that's all well and good. Now let's talk about our secondary xylem. Secondary xylem is produced by the vascular cambium, as is secondary phloem, but we'll get to that later. And if you've ever looked at the cross section of a woody tree, you know that it has annual rings. Well, those annual rings are actually technically wood. The term wood refers to secondary xylem only. And <clears throat> for in our cross section here, this would represent one year of secondary xylem growth. And the way we uh, look at that is there's early wood at the beginning of that annual ring and late wood towards the end because remember our growth pattern right now is in this direction from the inside out. So as the um, as the xylem is laid down um, let's look at this middle ray and let me, I'm going to change my cursor to another color just to not confuse things. We're going to focus on this particular annual ring okay. So this early section right here this would be in the spring. In the spring there's lots of water coming down. That's where we're going to have a lot of rapid growth. It's warm enough now. There's enough sunlight. So in that early section, that early wood that happens in spring, we have lots of very large vessel elements. So you can see in this image all these large holes. That's because there's a lot of water to transport. Okay, as we move throughout the year, here's summer, and depending on whether there's been a lot of rainfall or it's a dry summer, that will um, cause this particular annual ring to either be wider or thinner, just depending on the amount of rainfall and how much secondary xylem is needed for that year. As we progress throughout the year, then we're going to come to the fall and then eventually into the winter. And into the winter, everything goes dormant for the most part. So there's going to be uh, a very small amount of secondary xylem being laid down at that point in time. And because of that, all the, those very small vessel elements laid down together tight to each other, that makes a more dense um, ring essentially. So that's what causes that um, delineation between the first an the one annual ring and then the next. And <clears throat> so in our 
image here, then this would start spring all over again. Okay? And so even in our image here, when we have one, two, here, let me do it. One, two, and three growth rings, we can already tell that this second year seems to be the one that had the most water because more xylem had to be laid down. Okay? So those are our growth rings. Secondary xylem is what we call wood. That's the only thing that's called wood. Okay, nothing else. Not the bark, not the phloem. Only secondary xylem is what we call wood. Okay, our second type of vascular tissue is phloem. And again, it is a complex tissue. Um, unlike xylem, it is living at maturity and it transports nutrients. So it has three parts to it. Um, it has sclerenchyma cells that give it support. Um, that's pretty much a given with lots of things. But what makes phloem unique are the sieve, tu sieve tube elements, which are specialized parenchyma cells, and their companion cells. So here's what it looks like. So the sieve tube members, let me get my little thing here. Sieve tube members are the larger of the two cell types. And it has a sieve plate right here so that when transport, which goes in either direction, not just up, um, takes place, it allows for the flow to continue in the same direction. And the sieve tube members uh, cells are arranged to form a continuous tube, but sieve tube members have no have uh, sorry have cytoplasm, but they don't have a nuclei. Now, every sieve tube member has a companion cell, and that companion cell, and for this case, it's the one right here that lays next to it, um, has a nucleus that controls the companion cell and the sieve tube member. And there are plasma desmida that connect those two cells. So the, um, so the controls and the maintenance of both cells is organized and orchestrated by the nuclei of the companion cell. The sieve tube member alone has no nucleus. Okay, as we've been looking at the hierarchy of things, we've looked at cells, we've looked at the meristems that make the different cells and tissues, we've looked at the tissue systems, and now we're just going to do a brief overview of the plant organs. So what we're looking at today are the vegetative organs. That means all the parts of the plant that are not associated with reproduction. So we're not going to be talking about flowers today, just the vegetative organs. And we break that down into two distinct sections. There's the shoot system that has the stems and the leaves, and we have the root system. Okay, so our shoot system, um, that contains uh, several buds. And what that means, the bud is normally where the growth occurs, so it contains um, the apical meristems. So to start with, we have the terminal bud, and that one has been there um, been present since embryonic development and it contains the shoot apical meristem and it produces new shoot growth, growth, bleh, growth sorry can't talk and new leaves and other tissues associated with primary growth and then there are lateral buds right here and that produces side branches and so just for the terminology that you will need to know um, Every time we have a lateral bud, and wh which is normally where a leaf joins the main stem, that is called a node. Everything between one node and another is what we call an internode, which makes sense, right? So that is our shoot system. And this is what it looks like if you looked at a cross section under a microscope. Um, so our terminal bud up here would contain the shoot apical meristem, all of these cells right here that have those meristematic cells. And then here is the lateral bud that also contains a, um, an apical meristem as well.
And then there is our root system. And the root system um, contain, uh, contains our primary root, right, which was the uh, tap root to start with, and then it has lateral roots, and then each root has root hairs that we've talked about as well. So again, a cross section um, of our root system shows us the root apical meristem right here in this area. And that's where all the primary growth occurs in roots. That's just another picture of it. Um, you'll see that there, it's just a small amount of cells right here. That's our meristematic cell region. Okay, next time we're going to talk about the vegetative organs um, and look at them a little more closely. And that way we're going to look at the difference between monocots versus dicots. We'll see you then.